I just wanted to open up by telling you that I didn't always grow up wanting to be a ED specialist or a male incontinence specialist. That wasn't why I went necessarily went into medicine, but I went into urology and actually became a cancer specialist. That's really what I do the most of in my surgical practice. Uh, for about 13 years now, I've been doing a lot of robotic surgery for prostate cancer, kidney cancers, do a lot of bladder cancer work. And because I take care of a lot of prostate cancer and bladder cancer, a lot of the things we're going to talk about tonight can result from the treatment of those cancers, whether it's surgical treatment or radiation treatment. Uh, both of those can have similar kind of consequences in terms of side effects from either of those treatments. So as I was becoming a cancer surgeon and doing more and more of it, I realized that men were suffering side effects from these kinds of things potentially. And I was sort of saddened that I couldn't take care of them myself. And I, be, I made myself an expert, actually, over time. Uh, I became interested in the treatment of ED. I became interested in the treatment of male incontinence and uh, really looked into to training myself to do these kinds of procedures in a more in-depth way and actually, over the years, became an expert. And I do go out on the circuit, if you will, once in a while and give these lectures because I think a lot of the things we're going to talk about tonight are sensitive issues. Um, many urologists, I'm sure a lot of you probably see other urologists, a lot of urologists don't even talk about these things necessarily. Um, they're not necessarily skilled in how to treat a lot of these things. So I think um, I prefer to go out on the circuit to at least educate people and hopefully through these tapings and actually broadcasting on YouTube, we're going to educate a lot more people about what's out there, what's available to you. And um, I want to share with you tonight some of the things that are out there for you. We're going to go through some definitions of things first and then go into treatments. We're going to talk about erectile dysfunction. But as I go through my talk, you're going to see there's many, many medical conditions that can cause ED. So let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, what is it? What is ED? I mean, we think we know what it is, but, and we probably do know what it is, but it's the inability to achieve or maintain an erection persistent or significant enough for intercourse. That's what ED theoretically is. You don't necessarily have to have intercourse to say that you have ED, but that's the strict definition for the thing. About one in five Americans actually have it, men that are greater than 20 years old. So that's pretty uh, prevalent there. That's why all these Viagras and Cialis commercials that you see, they're not just showing these commercials for you know, their health. There's a tremendous market out there for the use of these drugs because it's a tremendous problem out there. There are many men that suffer from this, uh, even at young ages, believe it or not. And more than half the men over the age of 40 have some degree of ED. So you know, once you hit 40, it's all over. So you know, everybody in this room, at least from here up, we're all screwed, basically, based on that statistic. I mean, it's all downhill. But it's, it's actually true. The blood vessels that supply the penis are little tiny blood vessels that supply in there, and they're vulnerable. Just like you get hardening of the arteries to the blood vessels in your heart, so too can you get hardening of the arteries to the blood vessels in your penis, and they're vulnerable. If you don't get enough blood flow in there, it's not going to work properly. But that's a really interesting statistic to look at 40. You think that you're at your prime, and yet half of those men have difficulty too and it approximately affects about 40 million American men. So it's a pretty big number, pretty big number. So how does this all happen? How does an erection happen? First of all, there has to be arousal, and then the nerves around the penis become activated. So it actually is initiated by nerve inputs. That's what does it first. It's not a vascular thing, it's really a nerve stimulation thing. And then once the, the nerves are stimulated, that actually causes the blood vessels to dilate. There are little tiny muscles around the arteries. Arteries are the vessels in the body that actually bring blood flow in. Veins are the things in the body that bring, carry the blood flow out. But there's little muscles inside the walls of the arteries, and those muscles are stimulated and cause the arteries to stretch open. When the arteries stretch open, more blood can flow in. If you look at this cross section of a penis, you know, we're not trying to get too grotesque in here, but these are the central cavities of the penis called the corpora cavernosa. And there's two of these chambers that sit side by side inside of the penis. And inside of those chambers, it's kind of loose, spongy tissue in there. And that loose, spongy tissue fills up with blood. And once it does, the penis then can get firm and long. So that's how a proper erection happens. But while that's all happening, so we're getting good blood flow in there, 
you also have to make sure that the veins don't drain out the blood flow too soon. So you might have guys that come in and they say, Doc, I just can't ever get an erection, which means they clearly probably have a blood flow in problem. Or you have other guys that say, well, Doc, I get a pretty good erection, I just can't maintain the erection. In those cases, it's usually they have an issue called venous leak, where the veins dilate too soon and the blood just leaks right back out. So it can be an inflow problem or an outflow problem. But either way, whether inflow or outflow, we kind of treat it the same way. And it's nice to sort of talk about it and it's nice to maybe come up with a diagnosis for why we think you might have that issue, but we end up treating it the same way. Because interestingly enough, probably 15 years ago, we thought we were geniuses. We figured out that if there's an outflow problem, if there's too many veins and they're leaking too rapidly, what if we went in there and tied off all the, all the veins in the penis? You don't really need all those excess veins. And we did, we used to do venous ligation surgery for that. We'd had great results for about six months in these men, great results. It was like the cure-all. And then over time, the body is incredibly smart, but it ends up building and renewing all these extra veins. All these new veins would sprout up and they would start leaking too. So the venous leak or the venous ligation surgery didn't work beyond six months to a year. So that, that was not a viable long-term option. So we abandoned that procedure. While the artery is flowing in, these veins collapse so that the blood cannot leak out too soon. Where do we see ED? What kind of patients? That's what I was talking about a few minutes ago. This is not just about cancer victims. It's a lot of kinds of, many kinds of patients come in to see me that have all sorts of medical issues as the cause for their ED. The most common though is vascular. We see a lot of guys, as I said, the reason why you have ED is because there's usually not enough blood flowing into these little vulnerable arteries, just like you have blockage of the little arteries of the heart, so too you can have of the blockage of the arteries of the penis. Well, that's a vascular abnormality. You're not supposed to have blockage to those blood vessels, but you do because you have a buildup of atherosclerosis or plaque in these little blood vessels. And the reason why you have that is because your cholesterol is high or because your blood pressure is not well controlled, or because you have diabetes, or because you're a smoker. Those vessels become vulnerable because of other underlying medical conditions that you have that are probably poorly controlled. But the underlying, underlying issue is really vascular. And interestingly enough, they're really advocating now that if a man comes in with ED, that's his primary complaint, you really should be searching for cardiac anomalies in, the, in that person. You should work them up for cardiac dysfunction too because if he's got blockage to the arteries down there, he probably has blockage to the arteries up here too. So they're really advocating for cardiology consultation in those guys that their sole complaint really is ED. The other 30% of men that come in are diabetics. And the reason why diabetics get this problem is because diabetics have issues with their nerves. They get peripheral neuropathies. Um, and as I showed you in the beginning, those nerves are pretty crucial to initiate the whole erection process. But more importantly, diabetics have problems with the little blood vessels. They get bad blood vessels. That's why they have problems with kidney failure. The little blood vessels to the kidneys shut down. They have problems with diabetic retinopathy, eye problems, because the little blood vessels in the eyes are vulnerable, and so too down there. So the little blood vessels in the penis are vulnerable too. All of their blood vessels all throughout their body are vulnerable for blood flow issues, and ED is just one sign or symptom of diabetes. So we always screen for that too, should screen for it. Other things that cause ED, medications. You know, every single patient that I see is on some kind of medication probably, at least one antihypertensives, and antihypertensives are probably the chief reason why men might have ED. Some antihypertensives are worse than others that cause ED, and we can change those medications around with the help of your primary care doctor. We don't just do this stuff willy-nilly, but we might suggest to your primary care, could they switch them to a different category of antihypertensives? And that in and of itself might help. So we look at their medications and see if that impacts. There are also a, a sort of other assorted other reasons why men might have ED. Pelvic surgery or trauma can cause ED. Neurological causes, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, 
Uh, things like that can cause ED. Back issues with slipped discs and nerve compression can cause ED. Different kinds of endocrine uh, problems can cause it. So there's a lot of different kinds of things that can cause ED. It's not just cancer patients. That's not what we're talking about. In fact, that's the minority of the patients that I deal with are actually cancer victims, at least for their ED. And just like I talked to you um, when we talked about the stress incontinence, this is the exact same slide that I showed you about quality of life. You don't have to have sex to be alive, right? It's not cancer. It's not cancer. But you maybe do have to have sex to preserve the quality of your life. It's, it's not life and death, but for some men, it's more important than others. For some women, it's more important than others. For some men and women, it's not important at all. You know, when I have discussions with men about their cancers, for instance, the women usually are in the background going, I don't even want to talk about this. I just want to make sure my husband's alive 10 years from now. That's what they care about. And the husband's going, no, no, that's not what I want to talk about. I want to make sure this thing's alive. So there's very different perspectives in there, and also the age of the patient that I'm speaking with. You know, I, t I have to counsel 40-year-olds about their prostate cancer, too. I also counsel 70-year-olds about their prostate cancer. So it's a very different kind of conversation you're going to have with a 40-year-old than you might have with a 70- or 80-year-old about these things. So you have to tailor your conversation to the particular person that's there. But all of these things still apply. Again, not life and death, but in some way, a dysfunctional guy over time is not happy. They're not satisfied. Their partners may not be satisfied. It may not be that obvious. It may not be that evident, but a general happy, good marriage, it's clearly not dependent on sexual function, but it's a component of it. We try to support the men and women, the couples, on the basis of improving the overall quality of their existence. And in these cases, I'm jumping forward just for a second, as far as insurance covering some of the procedures that we do, even though we get pretty damn good coverage for these things, sometimes they balk at covering it because they say, this isn't, you, you don't need to have se proper sex for life. This isn't a life and death issue. Why should we cover this? And in some way, I, I understand the concept, but I don't. If they will cover prosthetic implants for women who have breast cancer, why wouldn't they cover this? So we're big advocates for that. If we can prove that it's clearly a physical issue, um, we're big advocates for fighting on your behalf to try to get these things covered. We will write letters to your insurance companies with the proper medical uh, data that they need to back it up, and nine times out of 10, they will improve it. That's today. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but that's today. There's still pretty good coverage for it. I can't say you have the same coverage for the Viagra's and the Cialis. That's a whole nother can of worms. But that's usually the pharmacy subcontractors that kind of end up doing deals with your insurance companies. What are the options for people who have ED? What can we do for them? First of all, sometimes family physicians will take care of these things. You, a lot of guys will have already been treated by the time they come to see me. They've been on a couple different drugs. You, it's, it's, not, it's, it's absolutely appropriate for your primary care doctor to try the Viagra's or the Cialis's or the Levitra's or the Stendra's or the, you know, a bunch of other drugs that are out there now for this kind of thing. They all work. They all work similarly. They work a little bit different. Each one of them has a slightly different mechanism. But as long as you're not on uh, nitric oxide or nitroglycerin for cardiac issues, you can really safely take any of these drugs just about. It's nitroglycerin that's the absolute no-no. So if those are those little pills that you put under your tongue, or sometimes it could be a preparation that you take every day because your cardiologist put you on nitroglycerin, you should not be taking any of those drugs in that case. That's the only exception. But anyway, the primary care physician might give it to you. Your urologist can treat it. And then the subset of urologists that, that is somebody like myself is a prosthetic urologist. Some of the treatments that I'm gonna talk about tonight can only be done by a prosthetic urologist who has experience with putting these types of devices in. We'll get to that in a minute. So what are all the options? The drugs, injections, implants, vacuum erection devices, urethral suppositories. And these, the, we actually use all of these things in some form or fashion. So I'm gonna talk about these things, let you know what I think is good, what I think is not so good, what's practical, what's not so practical, 
and see what you think. So the oral medications, I kind of jumped ahead already a little bit and told you a little bit about the oral meds. Listen, when I first started off in practice, we didn't have one single drug available to give to a man. Didn't exist. There was something called trazodone, which was really a sedative sleeping pill that as a side effect caused a little bit of erectile sort of arousal. That was about it. There really weren't any drugs at all. So imagine, you know, a practicing urologist suddenly had this drug called Viagra. My God, if you didn't buy stock in that company when, when Viagra came out, you're a knucklehead. It was an incredible thing to actually offer a drug to a patient that had reasonable side effects, pretty safe for anybody to take, and had pretty damn good results. So from that came the drug explosion of all the other drugs. Again, all a little different, all work a little different, all have some side effects that may not be as bad as some of the other drugs. So sometimes it's worth trying more than one kind of drug to see if the first one didn't work so well or had a, a wicked side effect. Try another one. We are advocates for that and we would help you through, through that. But they do work and basically the way they work is they dilate the blood vessels. Uh, there's a, a complicated sort of uh, physical uh, mechanism for how it works, but essentially it dilates the blood vessels and more blood flows in. That's exactly how it works. And they all work very similarly. It requires sexual stimulation. You can't just take the drug and then, you know, kind of wait around for 15 minutes and see what happens. You actually have to engage in something. You want to take it about an hour before the anticipated blessed event. So you have to wait about an hour. Some of the drugs may work a little quicker than that. Usually, typically, it'll work up to four hours or so, but with Cialis, it stays in your system for about 36 hours or so. So, you know, I, you know that's, that's up to you. I don't, I don't like anything in my system any longer than it needs to be in my system because everything has some side effects, if you will. But if you're planning, you know, a weekend in Vegas, that may come in handy. So, you know, you can plan it depending on what your lifestyle is like. You should definitely not take it more than once a day. And some of the oral medication efficacy can be affected by food. So some of the drugs you can take with food and some of the drugs you can't take with food. Some of the drugs you can take with fatty meals and some of the drugs you can't. Uh, most of them you can just take pretty much willy-nilly, but some of them ha you can't. And your physician will tell you about that. So there are some little restrictions about that. And they're pretty effective. Look, look at that number. You know, 50 to 85% of cases, men are going to have some kind of positive result. The problem is, is that it doesn't, it's not sustained necessarily. It doesn't last for forever, doesn't work all the time. Sometimes men stop the medication because it causes side effects that are just too annoying to them and it's just not worth it. So although that number sounds pretty good, it's not necessarily sustainable for the rest of your life or the rest of your sexual life, but it's certainly worth trying. That certainly is our first go-to thing when we have a patient coming in with this problem. Almost half of men with ED after prostate surgery, if they've had prostate surgery, what this little blurb is trying to tell you, about half of those guys ultimately stop taking the medicine just for what the reason I just said. They just don't like the side effects or the way it makes them feel or they feel it's not natural or they just have to plan too much. They're overall not satisfied with doing that. But if you're gonna have sex you know, once a week, um, this is just me sort of philosophizing, it's why not? I mean, I, I think you could use this for forever if, if it works for you. And then men with diabetes are about one and a half to two times more likely to move on to other treatments eventually because it just doesn't work. That's what I meant by saying it's not sustainable. It just stops working. The drug, you sort of develop a tolerance or a resistance to the drugs and you have to move on to another kind of treatment. Well, we talked about most of these kind of things about the oral, this is another slide about the oral medication. Some of the side effects, I didn't tell you. Headache, facial flushing, stuffy nose, upset stomach. Those are the most common kinds of symptoms that you would see, side effects that you might see. I did tell you about the nitrates, that's very important. And if you've ever had heart problems, you should tell your physician that you've had heart problems, not necessarily because you're taking nitroglycerin, but we have to make sure you're healthy enough to have sex. I mean, sex may be the most vigorous thing that you do in your life. If you're not in shape and you're not running and you're not jogging and you're not in great health, we have to make sure you're healthy enough to have sex. I'm sure you've heard that statement on the commercials, but it's actually quite true. So if we feel that you may not be, we might recommend that you get a cardiology workup before you go on some of these medications. And that just makes sense. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Let's talk about the next treatment option. It's called a vacuum erection device. 
essentially it's a vacuum tube. It's a, it's a plastic hollow cylinder that the penis is put inside of and there's either a manual pumping thing or a battery pumping thing, but it, by pumping that pump, so to speak, it draws blood into the penis. We use these vacuum devices all the time in men who've had the prostate surgery, radical prostatectomies for cancer, and this is how we rehabilitate them. So instead of sending them to the physical therapist, we make them buy one of these. They're pretty reasonably priced. We make them buy one of these gizmos and we have them cycle the penis once or twice a day. We have them kind of draw the blood into the penis. It gives you a very good erection, quite frankly, but you can't have sex with this cylinder on there. So what you have to do is remove the cylinder. And when the cylinder comes off, you're putting this ring device at the base of the penis to keep the blood in there. This has been around also forever, for forever. Um, and it's quite effective and some men find it, you know, very satisfactory, if you will, because it doesn't involve expensive medications or injections or implants and things like that. But most other men don't necessarily want to fool with this stuff. It, it takes, it's a whole sort of ritual that you have to go through. And by the time you're done, you know, your wife's probably asleep by the time you get back in there. So, you know, it, some men just don't want to mess around with all this. But we use it for rehabilitative purposes all the time. And when the men are doing that and they're used to using this a lot, they use it for sexual function too. And they might be quite satisfied with it. So it is an option and it's a reasonably priced option. It is not covered by insurance. Medicare will not pay for this thing, but it ain't gonna break your bank at all. It's pretty reasonably priced. We talked about some of these things, but a little bit of difficult mechanics sometimes, maybe you lack spontaneity. You could get some bruising if you don't quite do it exactly right. Some people think the, uh, the erections aren't quite as rigid as they know they should be. Might cause a little penile discomfort, some numbness, coldness. You know what, I have found that if you're motivated enough, there are guys that are willing to do anything to make sure they have an erection. So those are all the potential little side effects, side effects that go with. But I don't rule out any of this for anybody. I try to take them down, give them all of these options and see what they're willing to try. This is my least favorite option for ED. It's the urethral suppository, also known as MUSE, M-U-S-E. This person, the animated picture here, it shows this little applicator that goes down the urethra, the urinary opening. It is a teeny tiny little applicator, quite honestly. It is tiny, and it doesn't hurt to put the applicator in the tip of the penis like that. But inside of that applicator is this teeny weeny little pellet. And once you put the applicator inside the urethra, you, you squeeze that little ball or bulb at the end, and you pop in this little teeny tiny pellet in the urethra. And that pellet actually dissolves in there, and that medication is called prostaglandin, essentially. It diffuses into the... Um, into the substance of the penis, and that causes the blood vessels of the penis to dilate too. So that's how it's, it's sort of delivered into the urethra, but it dissolves and spreads into the cavernous spaces of the penis, and it, it actually can cause erections. The reason why it's not my favorite of all the different options is because number one, it doesn't work so well. It probably only works in about 40% of men that I find that are using it. And also they have more discomfort, not from the applicator, but the medicine itself is annoying. It causes a lot of uh, burning and discomfort and they end up discontinuing it a lot. So I'm just being honest, this is my experience with these particular medications, but again, some men who use it love it. If it works for them and they don't get irritation, maybe it's worth at least a shot. We usually start at a pretty medium to good dose and then I bring them up to the highest dose if need be. The next option, which we use a lot in a lot of our patients is intracavernous injection therapy. And what that means is, again, there's that grotesque sort of cut section of the penis with the two chambers inside. This, by the way, this chamber is where the urine comes out. That's the urethra. Again, this space inside of these two chambers is this spongy tissue space. And you actually can take a needle with a medication in there and inject directly into the side of the shaft of the penis into that spongy space. The needles that we use are little teeny tiny tuberculin syringes. They really are small. And you might think, my God, who would ever do something like this? But it's very doable. I actually teach the men how to do it myself. I show them how to do it. Um, we actually use a sample of the real medication in the office and they stay there till they either get an erection or don't get an erection. But I can teach them to inject themselves in five minutes. It's not difficult to teach someone if they're motivated to do this. 
you know, there are other men that will say, there's no way I'm sticking a needle in my penis, and that's that. They're, they, you know, then I know I need to move on to the next um, arena. But if you've heard these advertisements on TV that we guarantee you an erection for $179 or your money back, that's what it is. And then they charge you about $3,000 for the medication. It's an incredible ripoff what's going on out there. There's a lot of these injection clinics that are popping up, no pun intended, but they, they are. And what it is is injection clinics. And you don't need to be a urologist to do it theoretically. There has to be at least a physician signed on to the injection clinic somewhere, probably sitting in Denver, but he's sending his physician assistant or his nurses to run these clinics. And they basically will do a sample injection in the office for a patient and then actually sell them the medication a thousand times more than what it would cost you if you submitted it through your insurance company. Because insurance companies will usually pay for this. So if they'll pay for your Viagra or Cialis, they'll usually pay for this stuff too. But again, you have to be willing to do it. It's pretty effective. It's pretty effective in causing decent erections. It's not meant to be used five times a week. That's not what this is for. It's really at the most for once or twice a week. It's not really also necessarily recommended for very young guys. It's not what I like to go to for younger guys that are using this because long-term use of this medication can cause scar tissue inside the penis and that might preclude the ability of trying other types of options for you if this thing stops working. So sure, for, for older gentlemen, I think it's a great idea or for short-term use, if we're using this as a bridge to some other therapy or thinking that you're gonna recover more from the surgery, why not try this as an interim step? Very much an advocate for it and we do use this. Again, it's a teeny tiny little needle. It's not very painful despite what you might think, but it can cause discomfort. Uh, the medication itself can cause a little discomfort. So penile pain is one of the side effects, but pretty rare penile fibrosis or scar tissue I talked about, priapism or prolonged erection. I know we've seen the commercials about Viagra. If you have a prolonged erection that lasts for more than four hours, seek attention immediately. We've never ha I've never seen one single case of Viagra, Cialis, or any of those drugs. I'll probably get hit tonight though, I'm on call. But I've never seen one case of any of those drugs causing that. This can, this medication can, and that's why we start with pretty low conservative doses and have the men inch up on the dosage very slowly. They can do it at home. They actually are doing it themselves. We show them what to do. Start low and we work our way up. And if you do it in that way, we rarely will see the prolonged erection. And the reason why a prolonged erection is it may be good for, for a good time that night, but it'll stop working for the rest of your life if you don't get it down. So prolonged erections or priapism has to be corrected. You can't leave it like that. But it's doable, and I use it a lot. And then we go on to the penile implants. This is what I was talking about, that the uh, urologist that you go to has to have experience with putting in prosthetics. They have to be a prosthetic urologist. Prosthetics, too, have been around for a long time. It's been, you know, I've been in practice for 25, 26 years now, and I was trained to put these things in in my residency before I went out into private practice. I put in ones different now than I put in then, but they've been around for a long time too. So there are some very clever urologists out there from years ago that came up with these very ingenious devices, and even to this day, the, the prosthetics have not changed all that much again. Again, better materials, a little bit different release valves and pump mechanisms, but pretty much the same thing as it was years ago. Well, how does it work? Remember I told you about the two separate cavities that there are in the penis? Well, the prosthesis, actually, we put in a cylinder in the one ca cavity, we put another cylinder in the other cavity. There actually is a cylinder that's made out of silicone, but it's filled with saline. So one cylinder goes in the one cavity, another cylinder goes in the other cavity, all done through one single incision underneath the penis. Incision's only about that big. We can put this entire device in through that. So the cylinders go in each cavity. There is then a pump mechanism in the scrotum. It's a little ball. It's a little bit bigger than the one I showed you for the artificial sphincter. And then just like the artificial sphincter, there's a ball reservoir that, that actually has the fluid in it that is put behind the pubic bone where you, you'll never see or feel or touch it or know that it's there. It's imperceptible to you. As a matter of fact, just like with the artificial sphincter, you could walk around naked in the gym, no guy would say, hey, you have one of those things in there, don't you? 
They actually, you cannot, you, they cannot tell. And if they can tell, they're looking way too close. <laughs> you ought to leave. But anyway, you can't tell. You cannot tell. It looks completely normal and natural. And the only thing that you will actually feel is the ball or the pump because that's the control mechanism that actually gets this thing to work. And when you actually squeeze this ball, it's sort of a steady kind of squeezing. You need about, you need about five or six squeezes to transfer fluid from the reservoir into these cylinders. So instead of blood filling up that space, it's saline or salt water that's filling up the, the, cylinder, the cylinder that's inside of your cavernous channels. And basically, once it's pumped up, it can stay pumped up for forever. So we don't worry in this case about priapism. That's not hurtful. That's not hurtful at all. So you're pretty happy. Your partner's pretty happy. And you can have it pumped up within five or six seconds. So the reason why we like these devices, it really simulates spontaneous, normal activity, just like the good old days. If you're in the mood, within 10 seconds, you're ready to go. You can, be, you can be functional as long as you want. Your partner can have multiple orgasms. I mean, my God, I'm helping you people greatly. You should be thanking me. <clears throat> I've saved many a marriage, many a marriage. Who needs sex counselors, I mean, uh, marriage counselors when you can have one of these put in? But anyway, in all seriousness, though, um, it, is, it, is, it does sort of replicate um, the more natural, spontaneous type of erection. We put these things in as an outpatient also. It takes about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes to do it. Send men home with a catheter in their bladder and a little drain. They all come back the next day. We take the drain out and the catheter out and we check everything. They usually come back in a week. We do a second checkup and then they come back in four weeks and we actually demonstrate to them how to use this thing. That's the sequence of events of what's happening here. From the short term, it, it is painful. Uh, you do have to take off about a week of work or five or six days anyway of uh, kind of laying it low at home because you basically want to take it easy. You want to use ice packs for a couple of days. So there, there is a recovery period associated with it. But usually within a week, they're back to work and they're using the device within four to five weeks. So that tells you about where you stand as far as the recovery period is concerned. But some of the things that can happen, it, it may cause post-operative pain, but that's usually short term. There can be a mechanical malfunction where these, since it is a hydraulic device, it can break. But the actual chance of this thing breaking is in the order of 5% over the course of your lifetime I'm talking about. So these things are incredibly durable and if it breaks, we can replace it. And actually the replacement surgery is easier than putting in the implant the first time around. Not that you want to go through surgery again, but the, the, it is possible to fix it or replace it. And it's a pretty low, low incidence of that happening. The most important thing that we worry about is infection because it is an, a uh, prosthetic device. There is about a 5% chance of infection, although that's usually more so in diabetics than in non-diabetics. And also the device itself is impregnated with antibiotics and we're very careful about giving antibiotics before, during, and after. So the infection rate in my hands is actually way less than 5% as far as I'm concerned. So it's pretty low risk, but diabetics a little bit higher risk. The benefits are pretty obvious. We talked about it. Uh, it's a permanent solution. It's spontaneous. It can last as long as you desire. It's entirely contained inside the body. It's concealed. The patient and partner satisfactions are on the order of 94%, patients and partners. This is long-term. This is long-term. So from a satisfaction score compared to all the other options that I talked about tonight, including this Cialis and Viagra's and Levitra's, it's, it's better than all of them. That's why we promote this too, not as a first, not as a first option. This, this shouldn't be a first option for anybody. It really shouldn't be, unless they've tried multiple options by the time they've come to see me. And I get those kind of referrals. I have patients that are referred to me specifically for implants because they've tried many of the other options. But in general, a guy coming in off the street with ED, you really should not talk them into having an implant as their first option. It's not ethically appropriate. But having said that, it's the one that men, are, men and the women partners are mostly satisfied with compared to all the others. This statistic is wrong. It's really been around for 60 years. And nearly half a million implants have been you know, placed in this country. So it's, it's a very prevalent type of procedure that's being done out there. I did allude to earlier about insurance coverage. I already covered that. And in general, just to refresh your memory, almost all of them are covered most of the time. And if they're not, we will advocate for you, as I said. Sometimes we have to talk to the insurance physicians. We have to write letters on your behalf. 
but a lot of times we'll get them to cover it ultimately. If you think it, your insurance doesn't cover it, you really should let us handle it and also let the representatives from the company, we actually, the company that makes these devices has a team of experts who will help fight the insurance companies as well. And we have, they have other programs to uh, financially assist men who absolutely can't get the uh, prosthetic covered. And some of the risks are similar to the risks that we talked about, a mechanical failure, pain, we talked about all that. So in summary, it's a pretty common problem, just like incontinences, there's a variety of treatment options. You should talk to your partner. In fact, I really prefer to speak to see the, the, the man and the woman. It's wonderful when they both come in and consult with me. It just makes it a thousand times easier when they're both on the same page. And it's really adorable to see when they both are on the same page. Those are some of my happiest patients. You know, they're really there for a common sort of goal and it works out very well when they're both there. And again, you have to make sure that your urologist is a prosthetic type of urologist. And if not, go see someone who is. It's America. You can go anywhere you want.